Just a bit of a disclaimer before the video starts proper. I ain't gonna waste your time too much, I promise. This video is obviously very overdue. For very personal reasons that I'll probably touch on a bit in an update video, the production process was so much more harrowing than it had any right to be. I was thinking of rebranding or even canceling this video, but that just wouldn't be very satisfying, not for me or for you guys. That being said, this is coming out in December. If you want to treat this as a Nightmare Before Christmas special, then by all means, fuck the establishment. I just want to be transparent though. And I also want to thank the many people online and in person who've helped me get this done in spite of some rough times. Special mention to Spectre Spark for doing the thumbnail, Morquez Mariser, you'll know why he's important later, Wave Runner for editing a couple entries and just being a general lifesaver for this channel for a while, and especially to my audience, who have been endlessly patient and were super kind and encouraging when I expressed the troubles I was going through. Thank you so much. I made this for you, with all my love. Happy holidays, and I hope you enjoy. Howdy doody, everyone. It's your worst nightmare. Batman, I don't know what this fucking voice is. It was a farce, though, because it's actually me, Wombo. Yeah. I walked into that one. The holiday of haunt rolls around yet again, and also yet again, your boy is on top of that shit. Oh, what? You think I'm late for Halloween? I'm not late for Halloween. You're late for Halloween. I am kind of late for Halloween. I'm just still in the spirit, okay? And also, and also yet again, there are no jump scares. Believe me, I hate them as much as you. Amateurs, I tell you! Last year, I took you all on a tour of video gaming scariest locales, and most of them were hospitals. Hospitals did do me a frightened, and they still do do me a frightened. Why you gotta pee in a cup? Is somebody gonna drink that? This year, I'm turning my eyes to the fiends of the foreground, because what's a scary place without a scary face? Ooh, it's the top 10 scary video game monsters. Now, with a title like that, you might think, wait, is this a ranking of the scariest monsters or a ranking of scary monsters that you just happen to like? And the answer is yes. All these monsters will terrify me in some fashion, but some will also be precious to me. It's the compromise between fear and love that I pretentiously describe as morbid appreciation. Appreciation. This is what I use to justify my criteria making no sense. Couple caveats, I guess. I won't be too picky about what counts as a monster. Undead, ghosts, mutants. If it's a front to nature in some way, it's fair game. So long as there's an obviously horrific disposition to it. I'm not about to put fucking Temmies on the list. Also, while there will be some individual big bad boss enemies, I'm opening this list up to the small fries too. Pyramid Head, you're big, scary, and have a huge sword, but the common folk deserve the spotlight as well, okay? I hope you guys are following along, because I'm not. I've never followed a rule in my entire life. Okay, let's begin. Hey now, this ain't a monster. This is a creature of utter perfection and beauty. I might be letting my cringy dog lover side show right now, but I can't help it. I'm a cringy dog lover. Not only do I find pretty much all breeds adorable, but I always love their emotive energy, and I really like that they have this wide association with loyalty. It really resonates with me as someone who loves everyone, in spite of all my friends being garbage. So being the advocate of all things canine that I am, pretty much all of media is designed to make me fucking sad. Sad. I can't watch a single movie or play a single game that has a dog in it without fear of having my heart destroyed. I'm just playing Nintendogs waiting for it to become Old Yeller. At this point, I maybe should be numb to it, but one video game series is just way too relentless to its dogs. Resident Evil, just let the world have nice things. Maybe that's on me. I look at something cute and precious and I ignore the potential for disaster. Human zombies just ain't shit. That thing is slow, unsteady, and slightly prettier than what I see in the mirror. Make it a zoomier creature with boundless energy though, and now I'm scared. Now I'm fucked. Now I'm battling a really fast, really hard to hit creature with ambush tactics that won't waste any time tearing apart my flesh. <laughs> Aw, oh, whoever trained you did a shit job, little buddy. It's honestly remarkable just how different the dynamic is between dogs and just about every other enemy. Like, a dog has just as much familiarity as a run-of-the-mill zombie, and yet it's just way more anxiety-inducing. To the normal person, at least. I remain stout in my belief that all dogs are good boys. I wanna go pet the dog. I'm gonna go pet the dog. 
It's worth bringing up that dogs in Resident Evil come in a wider variety than I thought. My understanding is that zombie dog is pretty much the umbrella term for him. <laughs> Umbrella term. But even that label doesn't account for the Colmillo from Resident Evil 4, or the Adjul from Resident Evil 5. I'm counting them both though, cause they're high key the scariest ones. I feel like I should really hate this, and I sorta do. Resident Evil just does man's best friend so fucking dirty. Hey, it's that dog. I just really unfortunately can't deny the effectiveness. God damn, how could you? Remember the 90s? Do you know how to use one of these? Shot. I was a small baby boy, but video games were definitely doing some growth as well. For one, they learned to walk. Not just up, down, left, and right, but forwards and backwards too. Plus they just looked so li lifelike. Many franchises were handling the transition perfectly, but for a personal favorite of mine, we'd have to wait until 2000, when everybody's favorite video game icon finally hit 3D. <laughs> Oh, fuck. Okay, slight editing mistake. I can do that again, it's no problem. <clears throat> when everybody's favorite video game icon finally hit 3D. I'm tilted. Oh, okay. This is one of those things I did on purpose because my opinions are questionable. Gotcha, gotcha. I actually did debate for a while about whether or not this was fair game. Spider-Man is not originally a video game franchise, obviously, so I mulled it over with friendly neighborhood comic book geek Marquez Marizer, and he said, Hello, YouTube! That his price was a cameo. Fuck. Hi, Mork. Looks like you could use some help, Green Lantern. Mm. You need someone qualified here to explain the comic history you don't care about but need to know in order to understand this and justify this comedy bit. Oh, that's cute, but I hate it. Who's the comic book expert here? Well, if that means pedantic nerd, definitely you. Aw, that's sweet. <sighs> Spider-Man 2000 has two main antagonists, mad scientist Dr. Octopus and the villainous symbiote and all-around Nutter Butter Carnage. Their plan is to turn the residents of New York into parasites. I'll let you guys fill in the punchline on that one. After individually taking them both down, Carnage takes Doc Ock's body as a host, and what we get is Monster Ock. Both Doc Ock and Carnage had already been staple villains of the Spider-Man comics at this point, so including either of those two on a list of video game characters by themselves might be enough to disown Wombu as an inept lunkhead. But for Monster Ock specifically, this is the first time we know Doc Ock was joined with a symbiote. Sure, there was a Clintar invasion in that terrible Planet of the Symbiotes story, but we never saw him possessed. Point being, Monster Ock is a creation of a video game, and not just an adapted comic monster. So it's good for the list. And just like that, I'm in the clear. Thank you, Mark. But that doesn't mean it's the right choice. Spider-Man Edge of Time would go on to do a similar concept 11 years later. Doc Ock is fused this time with the anti-venom symbiote. And if that weren't enough, there's a new ingredient. The most evil element of all, CORPORATE GREED! Money. Nothing spookier than capitalism. The point is, Wampu might be an ignoramus, but a cheater he ain't. Even when I'm being defended, I just get thrown under the bus. I think you've done enough damage. Get out of here. Make yourself ghost. Should I be offended given who's talking? No, I am a ghost. I'm allowed to say it. You're not. That's how it works. You can't tell me how things work because I am a man and you are a light fixture. <laughs> Okay, I'ma try and keep the rest brief. Monster Ock was one hell of a surprise final boss. Spider-Man himself spends the whole game being like, hey, nobody can control the symbiotes. And Doc Ock is just like, maybe you can't, but I also can't. Butterfingers. You don't even fight him, really. You just run away from him. For that final chase, however, he makes an unforgettable impression. You don't really forget a large tendrilled monster chasing you through exploding tunnels as it screams at you to... doy. <laughs> Die! And he doesn't even seem that fast, but he just has a way of catching up. Before you even have time to think, why does this portrait have glasses? He does not wear glasses. He's all of a sudden gaining on you. No! That was too close. No! This chase goes on for like three minutes, and it's the longest three minutes ever. Moving on. Whatever you might want to say about a monster's physical appearance or lore, there's also going to be a lot of intimidation to be had from a monster that's crafty and cunning. Admittedly, you're not going to be seeing too many like that on this list because, well, my brain is gigantic. I would never fall for the nefarious schemes of a duplicitous, deceitful, dis- Oh, hello! It's me! Or maybe a clone of me. Alright, the politically correct term is Echo Fighter. 
Heck, man, I was so ready to give this spot to some other abominable mess from Hollow Knight. This game is about bug people. There was a lot to choose from. The existence of the royal waterways and Deep Nest alone give plenty of list material. And yet, coming from the latter, I couldn't help but always think back to Nosk and that cool build-up to his lair. Granted, this is far from the first time a game has pulled a fake out of this nature. In fact, it's not even the first time I've seen a mimic snap its neck and become a spider. It's just never a good sound. Honestly though, Nosk does it better. His mimicry doesn't last as long, but it does have some interesting implications for your journey throughout Deep Nest. Nosk is able to search through the memories of its prey and weaponize them by taking the form of a loved one, someone that its victim yearns for, like a sort of predatory empath. If it successfully targeted the player, then it begs the question, has it been quietly observing from the sidelines? And if so, is there something about the way we venture through Deep Nest that is somehow emblematic of our memories? Because I don't remember falling into this many spike pits. Maybe I sound a bit too theoretical, though. Hit me up any time, Pat senpai Is Nosk secretly the bad guy? <laughs> What's fascinating in a more concrete way is that a creature bent on pulling the heartstrings like this chooses to take the form of you. Why? Well, I guess it's just because I love myself, myself so much because I'm just so smart and amazing and cool and- Just kidding. I'm garbage and my self-esteem is forever in the gutter. I think the actual implication here is a lot more lonely. As if Nos couldn't find someone you cared enough about, so it just kinda went with impersonating you. That's pretty crushing. And it wouldn't even be true in my case. I got very attached to Quirrell, Hornet, Myla, Cloth, Cornifer, and not you! Get off my lawn, you rat fuck! Ow! Nosk is the best type of one-off monster, one where it becomes more interesting the more you think about the implications of its presence. So why isn't it higher? Because even without using exploits, its fight is Piss easy. <sighs> eh, it'll hit me eventually, maybe. Oh, my bad, I must have sneezed a little too hard. Now, the obvious rebuttal here is to point to the Godmaster DLC where they introduced Winged Nosk. Admittedly, this is more of a proper fight, but it lacks just about everything else I praised. Nosk is wearing the form of Hornet this time, and the whole fight is taken entirely out of its context, so it's just kind of a whatever change. If there's any takeaway here, it's that Godmaster was really disappointing. Fuck, now I'm sad. Playdead Studios did me a dirty. This company only has two games. Number two! And yet both of them had some really good contenders for this list. The Spider from Limbo is a quiet, ever-present force that all life within the game seems to fear. It's animated beautifully, and it's way too fucking persistent in killing you. Leave me alone, you're just a leg! Option two is The Huddle from Inside. It's Swanton Bombs, the CEO of a human experiment organization. <laughs> We have a winner. Call it my anti-corporate side coming out, I suppose. I'll kidnap a thousand children before I let this company die! Undoubtedly, the spider is more threatening to the player, but actually getting to be the big kill beast in a game where I didn't even expect a big kill beast, it was the kind of curveball that continues to stick with me. The huddle, and the overall story of Inside in general, is still being dissected to this day. Someone much smarter than me could go into the meaning of every subtlety and set piece, and someone much smarter than them could go into it with a completely different interpretation interpretation, until all the world's philosophers either kill each other or make out. Maybe both. Here's what I think. Inside is rife with puzzles and set pieces involving mind control. Throughout the game, you see large groups of people stripped of their individuality. They're almost like dummies, and not in the way that I'm a dummy, in the way that a dummy is a dummy. Understand, dummy? <laughs> The huddle is basically the most extreme and grotesque product of this, and yet it's after becoming one with the homogenized collective that players experience the most tragic, but also most empowering part of the game. The destruction you cause just by grabbing things is, in a very morbid way, kind of fun. Especially after playing as a helpless kid the entire game. But make no mistake, the huddle is a sad, sad, sad creature. Its section does not come without the constant groaning, or limb lossage of those it's comprised of. Looks like the huddle, Huddle just needs a huggle. 
Interestingly, the whole ending section of the game sees the NPCs at their most human. Most of them just run their ass away, but some of them actually help the huddle, while some just stare voyeuristically at my naked blob body. I think it's the very end that perfectly drives home that transition back to a sense of individuality. In the final moments of the game, the huddle crashes out of the facility and is relinquished of control both from the organization and the player as it basks in the sunlight. I see it as a freeing moment, but some people see it otherwise. And that's fine, because deep down, we're all valid. At least that's what I learned from destroying everything as an amorphous blob of limbs. God, I love video games. Hmm, this doesn't look like the reminding you to drink water Twitter page. What's this? Closeted Sonic fanboy over here, hmm? No, don't mislabel me in 2019, please and thank you. The adventure games are the only thing Sonic related that I know or care about, and Sonic lore in general is just too much for my one brain cell to handle. So when I inevitably say something wrong, I want you to exterminate every fabric of my being gently. Now Chaos is technically a recurring character in the Sonic franchise, but from what I can tell, its peak importance was in Sonic Adventure. Interestingly, for a creature literally named Chaos, it's not a bad lad to a fault. In fact, it's said to be very caring and sweet. You guys know of my countdown buddy, Chaos Key 4013? It's exactly like him. Ugandan Knuckles. Guardian of the Master and Chaos Emeralds, and a colony of adorable Chow, Chaos was indeed at first a very peaceful and passive entity. But then thirsty for the Emerald's power, in came an attack from the Knuckles clan, a group that is way funnier in name than in execution. <laughs> Speaking of execution, with the emeralds and the children compromised, chaos finally evoked its namesake. And everyone died, except for the clan chief's daughter to call, who sealed chaos away for multiple millennia, and then Eggman released it and got promptly betrayed by it. As is what happens when you're a goofy villain with less than no foresight. Precisely! As it turns out, a couple millennia to stew over the pointless brutalization of everything you love leaves you as the physical embodiment of vengeance. And damn, what a look. I love the sense of escalation that happens with chaos throughout the game. It's introduced in its absolute weakest form, and even then, it's pretty much unfazed by any and all damage. A creature whose body is seemingly comprised of mostly water cannot be penetrated by bullets. But as it receives more Chaos Emeralds, it goes through some increasingly intimidating transformations, from a big bruiser, to a shark, to whatever the fuck Chaos 6 is supposed to be, with its hydrokinetic abilities also getting a boost each time. My only real complaint is that we don't get to see even more of the in-between transformations. Like, what do Chaos 3 and 5 look like? The world may, tragically, never know. But then there's Perfect Chaos. Fulfilling the promise of the game's amazing intro sequence, Perfect Chaos is very summoning, just utterly ruin Station Square. There's a battle with it, but by this point, the whole city is decimated. The water tornadoes and giant mouth beams in its arsenal pretty much feel secondary to the impact of its overall presence. And somehow, against all odds, there is a happy ending for this thing. After being pacified by Super Sonic, Chaos reunites with its Chow and departs for Unknown Realms with Takal. I mean, basically they die, but you know, Unknown Realms, I guess. It's honestly an unexpectedly sweet resolution to take place in the middle of a giant watery graveyard. <laughs> All's well that ends well, right? You know what? Sure, I'm willing to look on the bright side. If the ocean comes for me, provided it goes through the effort of becoming a scary lizard monster, then it can have me. <laughs> number five? Are we sure this isn't number seven? <laughs> I'm a funny guy. I bet y'all forgot I was counting common enemies too. Remember number 10 and how it was about dogs? Feels so long ago now. I've played through Killer7 like four times and the story still makes no sense to me, so I won't even get into that. Never ask me questions, I can't reliably remember anything. And yet the Heaven Smiles are some of the most memorably stressful enemies I've ever encountered in a game. The basic idea is that they're all suicide bombers. Their general plan of attack is to get up real close and explode on you. Just shooting them will typically kill them, but if you're looking to take them out quickly, or upgrade your characters, or just 
heal, then you're likely going to be aiming at a specific weak point that will take him down instantly. A weak point that changes between each individual enemy. The first chapter, Angel, is nonsensical dumpster dirt. It's completely asinine. This game is stupid, but it is really good at establishing just how threatening the smiles are. The game is not always nice about how many smiles there are relative to the size of the room you're in, so the player learns very quickly that even two or three smiles coming at you at once can be overwhelming if you aren't prepared for them. But you know how the old saying goes, the party ain't over until gruesome death happens and everyone is dead and you cry. There's a few cutscenes just dedicated to innocent people getting horribly blown up, and they're all legit pretty upsetting. And then the heaven smiles were never scary, ever again. The following chapters do everything in their power to make them as absurd and silly as possible. <laughs> They introduce more variants that do shake things up, but it's at the cost of any and all dignity. For every genuinely difficult smile, there's also a fucking useless one. The broken smiles will rapidly approach you on their jetpacks and are actually hard to kill. The spherical smiles will roll at you at a fucking snail's pace and have the easiest weak point ever. The timer smile has multiple weak points and will frantically charge at you once it's on its last one, while the speed smile just kind of flails around. The laser smiles are the only ones that can hit the players from a distance, while the Almeida smiles are the only ones that wear a shirt. That's all they do, they wear a shirt. So I'm wearing the shirt now, and you may have noticed that I've kind of stopped trying to explain any scary elements of the Heaven Smiles, but I think it's time that I cut to the core of why I find them effective enough to put on this list. It's the laugh. The laughter of the Heaven Smiles plays not just in menus, but also when you kill them, when they kill you, and most importantly, when they spawn in. <laughs> It's a warning signal that instantly puts players on high alert. And there's only vague indicators on what type of enemy it is or even where it is. And for enemies that can kill you so quickly, it's never a good feeling. Which is why I personally do my best to be as unfunny as possible. Because if I hear anyone laugh, I will shoot them impulsively. Thanks for that, Killer7. Moving on. Hey, you guys remember when several decades earlier in the video, I said this? Human zombies aren't good because they're slow. I only want fast enemies in my video games. I can't be scared by other things because I got the brain of a fucking baby. At least I think that's how I said it. The point I'm making here is, well... Okay, listen, the explanation here is simple. Redeads are not humans. They are magic. Redeads is magic. I know it's a normie pick for a list like this, but if you're like me and you grew up a Nintendo child, then Redeads were basically the OG scary enemy. And yeah, I still think they're scary. My opinions might be subjective, but you're objectively kidding yourself if you think otherwise. I gotta throw my hands up on this one though, cause it is completely antithetical to what I said about the zombie dogs and how they're, you know, fast? Look, it's on a spectrum, okay? A normal walking speed enemy? Boring. I sleep. An enemy that outspeeds you? That's scary. I cry. Redeads, however, get their own tier. Last place in the snail races, asterisk, it doesn't matter if you can't fucking move. <laughs> and for its next trick, it'll take a piece of shit, make it disappear, and reappear inside your pants. There's always this uneasy sense of anticipation with that scream that they do, but the key really is in the subtle details. Their placement in isolated corners, the way the camera forces you to focus on them, and their slow, slouched over approach right before they jump you. It's a masterclass in how to present a relatively mundane enemy as an actual fucking threat. The Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask Redeads are easily the most iconic. They nail the empty husk look, and personally, they're the ones that scare me the most. A lot of people would argue that they look the most generic, and yeah, I guess that's an understandable criticism, you know, like, like if you're trying to be wrong. Twilight Princess, on the other hand, fuses Redeads Deads and Gibdos to create the Redead Knights. Instead of doing the grab, they swing a large sword at you, which I'd argue isn't as intimidating, but they make up for it by being way more imposing in stature. Triforce Heroes Redeads. Uh, what is that? That's that's a Redead? No, I I hate that. But the real cake taker is Wind Waker. These guys look cool as ice. The earrings and the doll-like proportions somehow don't sacrifice even a bit of the horror element, and the way they just stare at you all dead-eyed before lighting up, it's awesome. Unfortunately, none of the re-dead iterations are particularly hard to deal with. In fact, they're probably the easiest enemies to combat on this list. But you know, it's not the size of the enemy, it's the way you... No. It's not the speed of the enemy, it's... No, no. It's not the difficulty of the enemy, 
it's the way you present it. I'm saying Reed dad has got tiny dick. Hey, question. Earlier in this video, did I make it seem like Pyramid Head wouldn't be making this list? Cause that was a fucking lie. Of course Pyramid Head is on this list. Why wouldn't it be? Cause I said so? Don't trust me. I'm a creature of deception. And here I thought Redeads were the cliche pick. Sometimes the general consensus is just right. Pyramid Head tops lists like these with clockwork regularity, and it was pretty close to topping this one too. Womboy has a bit more surprises though. No need to thank me, just one of the advantages of being bad at what I do. Like Chaos, Pyramid Head technically appears in multiple games, but is pretty much only significant in just the one. And let me tell you, the monsters of Silent Hill 2 have some of the most well thought out symbolism I've ever seen in a game. I could spend the rest of this video dissecting every single one, but I'm feeling merciful for now. Pyramid Head is the single most imposing force you encounter throughout Silent Hill 2. Every other monster can be dispatched pretty handily, but Pyramid Head is the recurring creature that until really late game just can't be fucking touched. There are technically boss battles with it, but nothing you do ever seems to leave a visible impact. And that's because of all the monsters in the game, Pyramid Head has the most direct connection with James Sunderland, the protagonist. Pyramid Head's designer, Masahiro Ito, described it as another James. Not literally another James, obviously. It's not a big triangular James clone. In essence, it's a representation of the darker parts of James's psyche. It's the memories or urges that he has repressed. And in the process, embodying everybody's favorite topic, toxic masculinity. That's right, I was an SJW snowflake the entire time! In a game where nearly every monster has varying traces of femininity, Pyramid Head is the only overtly masculine one out of the pack. It's got a manly physique and an executioner's robe, but it goes beyond appearances, because it's also seen outwardly abusing the more effeminate monsters, oftentimes sexually. And no, I won't show that, I had the trigger warning at the beginning, but there's a goddamn limit. All the while, there isn't a single hint of of anger, sadness, fear, or really any emotion, and that's probably the scariest part of it. I don't mean it's just pure, uncaring evil. No, it's the way it is, because James is the way he is. The force of sexuality, the urge for violence, and the cold emotional exterior, it's a part of James's identity. And that's way scarier, honestly. Like confronting a version of oneself that's everything you don't want to be, but way more subtle than the sort of thing you'd get out of something like Persona. And that's not to take pot shots at Persona, but Persona ain't shit. I finally caught up with you. Ito also described Pyramid Head as a guardian to James's humanity, which makes a lot of sense. Towards the end of the game, James finally comes to terms with the memories that he's repressed, and the now two Pyramid Heads take their own lives, having fully served their purpose. It's an amazingly chilling moment. This completely untouchable creature is finally out of your way, and in this moment of silent reflection, the monster that needed to be is needed no more. It's perfect. Also, the corpse's T-pose for dominance, that's the truly wonderful thing here. Have any of you ever played a game franchise or watched a movie or show where, for some reason or another, you just can't bring yourself to care about the overall plot? Like, the lore is mostly lost on you, but you follow along with it anyway because there's one solitary character that has absorbed you and you want to know what happens to them specifically? Completely unrelated question, have you played Blaze Blue? Listen, I really like Blaze Blue, or at least I'm 70% sure I do, but this franchise's plot repeatedly slips from my mind like water from a duck's back. It just has that kind of story, you know? The told and scattered, not even chronological fragments kind of story. The alternate universes that can somehow justify these two characters being the same person kind of story. The non-material concepts such as creation or knowledge having actual physical manifestations kind of story. The I'm sorry, I only care about Araku 
Kune kind of story. Okay, I'm exaggerating a tiny bit. I also love Tao Kaka. But it's extremely telling that I find myself sucked into these games almost entirely thanks to the presence of Arakune, whose story is relatively self-contained. Originally going by Lot Carmine, aka Roy, he was an apprentice scientist with one hell of an inferiority complex. I can't blame him personally. The guy was apparently born on April Fool's Day. What are you gonna do? Desperate to impress his superiors, Roy pushed his research of the world's natural resources as far as possible, until he eventually stepped into a void of infinite knowledge across multiple universes. And then he promptly deteriorated into Arakune. Okay, funny joke, guys. Now where's my endless knowledge and wisdom? The character we're left with is honestly even more compelling than the events that brought him here. Even in his current state, his quest for knowledge continues, but as a stuttering half-conscious blob that can barely communicate with anyone. Given how much trouble I have articulating myself outside of scripts, I can relate, honestly. I would make a funny Arakune. I don't know what I'm even doing here. The path you are on will lead to a denial of reason if you continue. You will become an existence. Hey, can you tell me what's going on in this game? I barely know my own ass from a hole in the ground. Perhaps your existence is more akin to mine than I thought. Honestly, I just want to go home and play Kirby. Thing is, he's not all the way lost. When you can decode what he's saying, it's clear that his learnings as a scientist have carried over. There's this fascinating dichotomy where he's unquestionably out of his mind, but he's also got the knowledge and experience to partially transcend his own sanity. Now, if only intelligence directly trans translated into good judgment. Honestly, his most potent scenes are the ones where Roy gets some moments of lucidity, where he laments on the choice he made to sacrifice his humanity, and act as a warning for others before inevitably succumbing to his insanity once again. All of this is why I love Arakune's character, but it's still independent to the real reason why he's this high. In case you forgot, Blaze Blue is a fighting game. <laughs> I respect the deep tragedy of Arakune's existence. He's also a fun little bastard and I main the shit out of him. This might seem like mood whiplash to some of you, in which case I sincerely don't care. Get over it, you ninny. Arakune's playstyle is defensive, but also high on pressure. With invisibility, teleportations, and lots of traps to set up, the idea is to overwhelm the opponent until you can get them cursed, at which point insects will swarm them with every input you make, and your combo ability and damage will skyrocket. He's the kind of technical fighter that's hard to learn and can be easily wailed on if the player has no clue what they're doing, but is also a joy once the intricacies finally click into place. Word from the wise, though, battling a good Arakune is a lot. And if you don't want your friends to hate you, then be humble, be nice, keep the maniacal laughter inside. <laughs> good game, good game. These Halloween lists are a joy to make. Aesthetically, I have a lot of fun, but sometimes I'm just able to get into really personal shit in order to lead into my entries, like what sort of animals I love, or what sort of monsters I'm scared of, or how as a child I used to bite the rubber off of control sticks. Nah, I'm just kidding on that last one. I still do that. I have the opposite mentality when it comes to making my YouTube channel. I hate referencing myself. I'd like for every video to hold up in isolation, and I don't think people should have to watch previous works of mine to understand any single video. That being said, I know it's not just newcomers watching, which is why I need to say this. If you've been a fan of mine for a while, well, first of all, thank you. But also, I'm so sorry. Your Womboy is fucking washed up. What? Boo. Fucking boo. <laughs> I understand if anyone's annoyed. Saying this now, don't want to dwell on it, I've talked about the Amalgamates in four separate videos. Once about their boss fights alone, twice as an aspect of the entire True Lab, and once as a joke. I admit it, I have a problem, and I will be going to rehab once this video is done. Until then, I want to do them justice, and cut to the core of why their ubiquity across my channel has been totally deserved. First of all, if you're looking at the rest of this list, it's not hard to see where my praises for other entries would extend to the Amalgamates. The surprise factor, the variety, a tragic origin story, the multiple beings mixed into the same entity, the dogs, they pander exactly to my taste in monsters, but more importantly, they pander to me as the one kid who looked at the carry-on carcass from Time Splitter's Future Perfect and thought, but don't they have loved ones?
In most games, questioning the underlying relationships of your typical mutant baddie is kind of fruitless. The Amalgamates, however, don't just have an answer, but a full-on through line. They absolutely have loved ones, many of whom you meet throughout the game. They're former patients of Dr. Alfie's who tried to simultaneously extract their souls, but keep their life force going using the power of human determination. And such is the power of human emotion that any creatures that possess it just melt into one another, apparently. That's chemistry for ya. This brings me to the main reason why I love the Amalgamate so much. They are the most humanizing take on mutant creatures I have ever seen. They don't come off as feral. Their conscious is very much still present, albeit as collectives instead of individuals. And they each have distinct personalities, none of which are overtly hostile, and all of which invoke different feelings. And while I might have spared you the breakdown of each Silent Hill 2 monster, we're on number one now, so fuck you. The memory heads are the first ones to be encountered and have probably the toughest fight of the pack, but are also the most social and friendly. The dialogue interaction is framed as an invite to a get-together over the phone. And I don't know about y'all, but these guys look like my kind of crowd. By contrast, the Reaper Bird is utterly incomprehensible in dialogue, but has some of the most passive battle mannerisms. It can still damage you, but its attacks have this very incidental nature about it. Lemon Bread is probably the most hostile, but they also seem to be the most aware of their current circumstances. They come off more scared and lonely in their dialogue. They have the most most intimidating design, but also the most delicious sounding name. Then there's the Snowdrake's mother, who probably retains the most individuality and is unambiguously longing to see her family again. She's the single most harmless one, and if any amalgamate is gonna make you feel for these guys, it's going to be her. Finally, there's Endogony. It's a dog. Yes, it's a surprisingly effective and morbid comic relief presence that properly emphasizes the horror of the situation while being legitimately kind of funny, but it's a dog, and is thus good purely on that merit. And what's great is that each of these guys are dealt with purely through placating. You encounter them through pacifism, and you treat them with pacifism. And it's not for nothing either. As it turns out, there's actual happy endings for these guys. They go back to their families, and it's nice. That's what I love about the Amalgamates. They're horrifying, but they're properly framed as victims rather than abominations. Undertale gave me the adorable mutant family reunion that I had wanted to see since I was a weird misguided child. And then, as a weird misguided adult, I promptly immortalized it for years on end. I think this is it now, though. We've had a good run, little birdies, but it's time for you to fly from the nest. You live the best lives you can now, and I'll probably see you next Halloween. <laughs>